The IL-2 is perhaps the most famous of Soviet aircraft from World War II. Since it saw service during the war, many things were said about this plane and its combat performance. Today, we are going to have a look at the role of the IL-2 in the Soviet Air Force and what tactics were used to make this plane become one of the finest ground attack aircraft ever to be built. When the Germans invaded the Soviet Union, only a handful of IL-2s were in service. Distributed among the military districts and the Soviet Union at large was not yet ready to use them. With the Germans blasting open the door, the training and the creation of new attack squadrons was accelerated. As pilots and technicians were trained, so too did more and more IL-2s find their way to the front lines. When counter-attacking at Stalingrad, the Soviet Union possessed over 1,600 IL-2s. At Kursk, that number even rose to 2,817. Considering the needs of the Soviet Union and the effectiveness of the plane, the production of the IL-2 was a high priority. Air Marshal Alexander Novikov wrote, Attack aircraft were simpler in design and cheaper. By virtue of their numbers, multiplied by the excellent combat qualities, they largely compensated for a certain lack of bombers that we experienced. Starting the war as only a footnote in the Soviet Air Force, sitting at 0.2% of the total force, it would grow to make up nearly one-third of the Air Force. No surprise then that the IL-2 became the most produced aircraft of the war. But how come that this one plane became so fundamentally important to the Soviet Air Force? To answer this, let us have a look at the initial combat records of the IL-2. The IL-2 has a peculiar combat record during the first phase of Operation Barbarossa. On the one hand, the pilot that returned from successful missions always spoke of the high potential this plane had. On the flip side, mechanical failures were quite common. During the first months of the Great Patriotic War, the survivability of an IL-2 averaged 8 to 9 sorties, while the regiments that took the brunt of the fighting even reported figures of 3 to 4 sorties per loss. The aforementioned mechanical failures are often given as one reason for it. Yet, that is not the full story. The IL-2 pilots themselves were often hardly ready to go into combat. With the Soviet Union losing more and more ground, the training for the average IL-2 pilot was very, very short indeed. In fact, the ability to take off, fly and land within an acceptable level of competency was initially deemed enough. Pilots were not instructed on how to best use their weapons and had no tactical education to speak of. While the Soviet Union had operated ground attackers before, the IL-2 was a new breed and no one knew for sure of how to best use it as of yet. The best example might be from the end of June 1941, when the first combat sorties in World War II were flown by IL-2s. Although having never dropped a single bomb, fired a rocket or even opened up with their cannons and machine guns in training, the pilots were tasked to destroy bridges on the Berezina River and hinder the German advance. They were able to complete their task after five days of continuous fighting. Later on in the war, similar tasks would require a lot less time. Although successful, the Soviets paid a heavy price, with 21 IL-2s and 90 pilots lost. The IL-2 itself was a forgiving machine, easy to fly and precise in its maneuvers. Plenty of novice pilots also took comfort and courage from the thick armor plating around the cockpit and engine. About 90% of the aircraft that sustained damage were also repaired in the field. Where needed, IL-2s were also used as ad hoc fighters and tasked with patrolling certain areas, or even escorting other IL-2s. Although it is often considered to be a slow and ponderous plane, the IL-2 could go at reasonable speeds and picked up quite some momentum in a dive. During World War II, more than one Heinkel 111, Junkers 52 or Junkers 87 fell at the hands of a gung-ho pilot flying an IL-2. Let's have a quick look at the organization of the IL-2 regiments before we delve into the tactics. Before 1944, the IL-2 attack regiments usually had 32 planes, 10 per squadron and 2 command IL-2s. In 1944, this was changed to 40 aircraft. Of course, these numbers are the theoretical makeup of a regiment and could vary from reality. And that brings us to the tactics of the IL-2. Note that while a lot of this seems like common sense to us now, the Soviet pilots had to learn most of these techniques by themselves, experimenting in the early stages of the war and keeping track of their performance to see what tactics worked best. While some deep strike missions were flown, about 80% of all IL-2 missions were within 10 kilometers of the front lines, something that I also noted in a discussion with Military History Visualized. Alright, so let's get hands-on with the tactics. The zigzag slalom approach was straightforward, designed to allow a number of IL-2s to continuously hit a target while avoiding most of the flag. 
coming from one direction, the lead IL-2 would make a 45 degree turn, followed by his flight, before abruptly turning 90 degrees and going straight for the target. Passing it, the rest of the flight would do the same. Again, the lead pilot would turn 90 degrees and hit another part of the column. If well executed and at the right intervals, this tactic confused the AA and the sudden fast movements prevented gunners from zeroing in. Another favorite tactic was a scissors maneuver. Two IL-2s would break away into opposite directions as they approached the target. Ostensibly flying away, they would suddenly turn and hit the target. After that, it was rinse and repeat. This weaving pattern allowed pilots to hit the same spot from two directions at the same time. Interestingly, IL-2 pilots and especially the more experienced among these had dedicated ways of engaging certain targets. While at the start of the war the ordnance was used in any way possible, that quickly changed. As the pilots gained more experience with their armament, they learned how to best employ this ordnance. Smaller bombs would usually be used only against lightly armored targets or trucks, while bigger bombs were used for buildings, heavy tanks, bridges and fortifications. Rockets too were reserved for the most high value targets. Lastly, the guns were used against soft targets or whatever needed to be suppressed. Only once the ordnance was used were the plane's guns turned against the more heavy machinery. Of course, the situations varied more than on paper, so exceptions to this rule are plentiful. All in all, however, IL-2 pilots became very good at deciding what weapons to use against what target. The Soviets even estimated that 8 IL-2s with a standard loadout could work on an 8 target area 100 meters in width and 200 meters in length. That's roughly 330 to 660 feet. This way, overlap was minimal and the target was best saturated with explosions and stuff that makes soldiers hit the ground. IL-2 pilots would operate similarly when equipped with PTAFs, small shape charges dropped from 100 meters or above at troop concentration carrying up to 192 p-tubs each, a carpet of up to 50 meters in width and 70 meters in length left little chance to German armor. And if you want to know that in Imperial, that's an area 50 feet in width and 230 feet in length. One last tactic that deserves to be mentioned is the circle. Not only a great defensive strategy if attacked by fighters, it allowed the IL-2s to wreck a long column continuously with all kinds of ordnance. Coming in from a line formation, the IL-2s would typically dive from an altitude of 800 to 1200 meters, that's 260 to 4000 feet, and strafe the column. The leading aircraft would then pull up, use the speed of the dive to recover some altitude, and then turn. By the time it completed its turn, the last IL-2 was generally just in the middle of its past, allowing number one to go back in. Imagine this circle being completed twice, thrice, or even four times, and you'll get the picture of what could very well happen to the enemy ground troops. Sadly, with all the things that happened on the Eastern Front, it is impossible to calculate the exact numbers of destroyed Axis equipment and killed personnel. Both Soviet and German sources indicate that the IL-2s were rightly feared. The increase in German AA on the Eastern Front and the more dispersed columns also speak for the effectiveness of the IL-2. Although it had a rough start, the IL-2 became ever more important to the Soviet Army. One final note on the durability of the IL-2. Soviet statistics contradict each other at times. Overall, of about 36,000 built planes, 10,759 IL-2s were lost. Add to that another 800 by the naval units. That's 29% of the total Soviet aircraft losses during World War II. 24% of all losses came from enemy fighters, 43% from AA and 32% failed to return, meaning that they were probably caused by a mix of AA, fighters or accidents. Nevertheless, the IL-2 was an exceptional potent machine, a plane that gave as much as it could give and became a staple in the Soviet armed forces. I hope that you enjoyed this video and that you learned something from it. A huge thank you once again to all my patrons that make these videos possible. If you want to learn something about the enigmatic Heinkel 100, at one time Germany's fastest plane, click here. Or if you want to know more about why the MC-202 has asymmetrical wings, click here. As always, have a great day, good hunting and see you in the sky.